and we should be now able to uh, pick up where we left off so that we um, see where that was. We just defined matrix matrix multiplication. We said that if we have a matrix A and we multiply it by another matrix, the way we do that is to think of the second matrix as being kind of a storage unit for column vectors. And we just multiply individually each of the columns of B by A. And this definition is not the most intuitive definition, but it, it's kind of the only way you can define A times B. If you want it to have some nice properties. In particular, although I'm not going to put a proof on the board, this definition is sort of tailor made to guarantee that multiplication is associative. It was designed to make sure that if we multiply three matrices together, It doesn't matter what order you multiply them in. And having mentioned associativity, we should let's, um, let's go and talk about the properties of matrix matrix multiplication. So matrix matrix multiplication has some properties you might expect. This first property I was just talking about, it's associative. And actually let me spend a second talking about this. Um, why does associativity matter? Why is it so important? Well, multiplication is a binary operation. You multiply two matrices together. That's our definition here. So if we can only multiply two matrices together, we should in one sense not be able to write A times B times C. Uh, multiplication is binary. We have three matrices here. But what associativity says is, well, you could put parentheses there and then A times B is defined. That's a matrix. And this matrix times C is defined. And in particular, associativity says that it doesn't matter where you put those parentheses. So anytime you want to multiply more than two things, that multiplication had better have an associative property. It's really important from a sort of practical point of view. Multiplication has distributed over addition several times already in this class. Multiplication distributes over addition. And that is also true if instead of multiplying on the right, 
you multiplied on the left or vice versa. And this is our first hint that multiplication is going to in some ways be different from the multiplication we're used to. Because if, if you're working with real numbers, for example, there would be no reason to write two separate statements. If you were working with real numbers, then multiplication commutes. So A times B plus C equals B plus C times A. And there wouldn't be any reason to give those as two separate cases. So something must be up here, but we'll get to that shortly. If you have scalars, you can move those scalars around. So if A and B are matrices and R is a scalar, here's um, an equality that is true. We can move the parentheses around. We can attach the scalar to B instead of to A. It doesn't matter where the scalar shows up. And the last property requires a um, requires a preliminary definition. We define the identity matrix I to be the square matrix that has ones down the main diagonal and is zero everywhere else. So we always call the identity matrix I, but we have a two by two identity matrix and we have a three by three identity matrix and so on. But ordinarily, we just use I. Um, if it's genuinely likely to cause confusion, we, uh, we could call this I sub two, and we could call this I sub three. If, again, if we were sort of <laughs> genuinely worried about causing confusion, but normally just I. And this last property says that I is sort of the matrix multiplication equivalent of one, A times I equals A, and I times A equals A. And I've been sort of assuming this, let me state it explicitly. Remember that you can't multiply every matrix by every other matrix. A if A is M by N, then this matrix B has to be N by K. The inside dimensions have to match. So 
here. I haven't written it down, but obviously I'm assuming that the dimensions of these matrices allow us to do the multiplication that we have written on this frame. So uh, these properties are up to a point, what you'd expect. We expect multiplication to be associative. We expect multiplication to distribute over addition. We've already seen a bunch of examples with vectors where we can move scalars around. That last property is maybe a little more foreign to us, but it says that there's a matrix that is like one when you're multiplying matrices. On the other hand, matrix multiplication is missing some properties that you might expect multiplication to have. <laughs> And we've already sort of gestured at the first missing property. Which is commutativity. Commutativity. A times B does not equal B times A. And some of the time this is obvious because in a lot of cases, one of those products won't even be defined. Like if A is three by two and B is two by two, there is no question of A times B equaling B times A, because B times A isn't even defined. The inner dimensions do not match. So if only one of these products is defined, obviously they can't be equal, but this is true in general. Um, in particular, if A and B are square matrices, of the same size, then both A times B and B times A are defined, but they're not equal. Or at least it would be a freak if they were equal. I mean, we can. The way we've defined multiplication is kind of inefficient to do it um, by hand. We'll learn a shortcut soon, but let me go to the calculator and let me math, let me matrix. So here's some matrix A. Let me create a, keep going into the wrong menu. Let me create a matrix B that will also be three by three. And I'm not, you know, intentionally trying to create a bad matrix or anything. I'm just sort of entering B at random and I quit out and I multiply A by B and I get this and I multiply B by 
a and I get something completely different. So matrix multiplication is not commutative. That's by far and away, I think, the most important property that we're missing, but important in its own right. is that we're missing canceling. I want to say that should probably have two L's. So if you um if you're looking at real numbers and you have A times B equals A times C you can cancel the A's and get B equals C. We don't have any property like that with matrices. If A times B equals A times C, it does not mean B equals C. And you're going to do a homework problem where you look at an example of this. So I won't speak about it further for now. And we are missing the zero product. Property. So if A and B were real numbers, then A B equaling zero would tell you that A is zero or B is zero. If you multiply two matrices together and you get the zero matrix, this does not tell us that A is the zero matrix or that B is the zero matrix. In fact, it's possible to find matrices A and B whose product is the zero matrix, but who have a lot of non-zero entries. And maybe even all of their entries are non-zero. Once again, as far as looking at an actual example of this, there is one in the homework. So we move past it in the lecture. So multiplying two matrices together, if you're working by hand, I don't think most people use this definition. Just like with matrix vector multiplication, there's kind of an alternate way of looking at this that is maybe quicker to do by hand. Although, really, you, if I mean, once your matrices get to be like, even slightly big, like five by five, multiplying them by hand is really out the window anyway. So let's say we have a two by two matrix and we have a two by three matrix. Then their product 
is going to be a two by three matrix as well. Two rows, three columns. And if we want to multiply this matrix by hand, the normal trick is as follows. We're going to fill this matrix in one entry at a time. So take the first row and the first column. Well, we go over here and we take the first row of the first matrix and the first column of the second matrix. And then that kind of trick we did when we were multiplying matrices by vectors, where you took these, multiply them, take these, multiply them, and add those up. We do that. So one times one is one, zero times two is zero, one plus zero is one. And then we just repeat that. So if we now want this, it's the first row and the second column. So we take the first row and the second column, one times zero, zero times two. When we multiply and add those up, we get to zeros. And now we just keep doing this. It's obviously going kind of slow at the moment because I'm taking my time, but once you get used to this, it's, um, it can be done pretty quickly. So like that entry there, it's first row, third column, one, zero, so one. And now maybe going a little more quickly. This here, we're now in the second row. First column, three minus two is one. Second row, second column, zero minus two is negative two. And finally, second row, third column, three plus one gives you four. And of course, if instead of those nice integers, we had a lot of ugly decimals, that would have gone a lot less smoothly. But if we'd had a lot of ugly decimals, there isn't any good way to do it by hand. We just plug them into the calculator. So if you have small matrices with nice numbers, this is kind of the usual trick that people use. Questions so far? And we've got just a smattering of definitions um, that we'll round out this section with. 
matrix powers are defined in the completely natural way. I guess the few comments I have to make is that here we're going to assume that this K is a natural number. Real numbers, we can have all sorts of powers. We can raise a real number to one half. That's the same as the square root, for example. But for matrices, just natural numbers. And for a matrix power to be defined, A has to be a square matrix. And that's just, that's just down to the dimensions having to match. If you have a two by three matrix, for example, and you tried to square it, you wouldn't be able to do the multiplication because the inside dimensions wouldn't match. So just by the way we defined matrix multiplication, we can only raise square matrices to powers. At the moment, that's basically all I have to say about this. We are going to use matrix powers later in the course. There's a very interesting application of linear algebra to probability that we will study using these powers. But for now, having defined them, we'll move on. The transpose, I'm just going to mention and say very little about it. A matrix transpose is written as a matrix with a little T up there. And what the transpose does is it turns rows to columns. So say that A, for example, was one, 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 zero, two, three. A transpose is going to be three by two. Its first column is going to be the first row. Its second column is going to be the second row. Um, we're not going to have the time to get into the main application of transposes, which is symmetric matrices. In um, a lot of real world situations, you've got matrices that are their own transposes, and those matrices have a bunch of nice properties not, as I say, going to have time to get to that. Um, it's a kind of banal application, but transposes show up a lot in the programming. Like you have a program that takes an input and spits out a row vector. And then later in the program, you want to use this row vector. You want to use this row vector in a second program. But the second program won't take 
a row vector as an input. The second program you want to use requires that your inputs be column vectors. So you take this row vector, you hit it with the transpose, it's now a column vector and can be fed into this second program. And that is it for that section, which is good. We'll have or should have time to do the next section as planned.